He's, he's speaking to Timothy in the singular. He says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. Paul writes as though he knows this God personally. Sit down and we know that he does. You may be seated. Sorry. Sorry. Be so careful how you say things, right? (laughs) Okay. Well, just by way of introduction, I want to kind of apply this to the day and age in which we live. As you know, um, we live in a day of relativity where truth is relative. It's what you make of it, it's how you see it, it's what you want it to be. The individual is sovereign and the authority. We are not only into relativity, we're into subjectivity. Again, another way to say that the individual uh, determines what is good and right and true. And with that comes the idea of compatibility. We want our ideas to work. We want the ideas that are popular with people to work. And what we, what we find is God operates under a different set of principles. He operates in what's called sovereignty, which means that he alone has rule and dominion and supremacy over all people and all things. And with that authority comes not compatibility, but exclusivity. That's an idea that, again, God, as he mentions here, who alone possesses immortality. The God who alone is wise, 1 Timothy 1, 17 describes him. He's the God who stands apart from uh, sinners and the system in which sinners so easily conform. And when Paul writes to Timothy, he's writing from that position of supreme authority. He's saying, Timothy, this is how the God of the universe wants you to live your life. He wants you to flee certain vices, love of money, love of uh, desire for wealth. He wants you to follow after certain virtues like righteousness and godliness and perseverance and faith. And he wants you to fight for not your own agenda, your own desires, your own wishes, but for the faith which has once for all been passed down from Christ to Paul to now Timothy. He's to fight for the faith, the Christian faith. And he's to be faithful to all that, he, that has been instructed to him in this letter here of 1 Timothy. God is calling Timothy to follow his rule, his sovereignty, his authority, his exclusive rights as head of the church, as savior of all, who's entrusted Timothy with his message to, and, to, and with his church to govern over it on his behalf. And so there's a tone of authority. It really comes out in the doxology. Do you see it in 15 and 16? When he's thinking about the return of Christ and he's reminding Timothy, you need to be faithful to this command until, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
when the sky split and his shining light burst forth from his own person. A return that will come at the, at the proper time. In other words, the father's own time. Not Christ or the angels know when it is. It's the father's own time. And look how he describes God the father. The one who is blessed, that is self-sufficient and contented. The one who is the only sovereign. The one who's king of all kings, lord of all lords. Ruler over all rulers of the earth and who alone possesses immortality. That is deathlessness. The one who cannot ever cease to be, who will never die. Even his, uh, at the atmosphere around him is unapproachable as he clothes himself with light and dwells in that unapproachable light who no man has seen or can see. What, what glorious Exalted thoughts Paul brings to Timothy as he charges him to live as a man of God in his day. Amidst the false teachers, despite the, the, the difficulties in the church with different people and different challenges that he's going to face, he raises his eyes to the God who no man has seen or can see, who is worthy of honor and dominion. You know, it's, it's when we think great thoughts about God that we're emboldened to think the way he thinks and do what he says no matter what. We have to have our minds filled with the truth of who he is. Lest we be stuck in the relativity, subjectivity, and compatibility that is so natural to our fallen hearts. This, for Timothy to do these things is going to require as he's a, a, a real fight. It's a real fight. It's a contest. It's a battle. It's an, it's an, an, it's a, my, a, a, an agonizing, striving um, battle that he's going to be engaged in for the rest of his life if he's going to be a faithful ambassador of the true gospel and govern things biblically in the church at Ephesus. It is no less than a fight. Which is why so many churches have gone the way of liberalism and have abandoned historic Christianity because they're not fighting. They're not fighting. We, as Christians, must fight. And Timothy, as an appointed elder in the church, must be a leader in that fight, contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Every component of it. If you go in chapter one, that means he has to refute false teachers. He has to find where people are straying, turning aside into fruitless discussion, and he needs to call them back to the true gospel, even if it means calling some of them out by name, which he does in verse 20, him and Elias and Alexander. It means instructing the men to pray and be faithful in prayer and the women to be modest and, and dignified in how they present themselves and be faithful to their children and raising them with um, dignity and, and self-restraint. Faithful to uh, the other elders to hold them to the biblical standards to which God has called them in character um, and in, in teaching and also uh, as he says in chapter four, he's got to take care of his own life. He's got to be disciplined for godliness. He needs to uh, labor and strive and put forth great effort. He needs to take care of the widows and make sure they're not neglected. That's a responsibility that Timothy's been charged with along with the elders. And he also has a charge to uh, protect the elders from false accusations and also to discipline if that's needed and then again, in chapter 6, he goes back to the false teachers. All these things make up the commandment, verse 14. Keep the commandment without stain. I think Paul is summing up all the, the various things that he's instructed on all the way through, calling it the commandment. And Timothy is to keep that, notice, without stain or reproach. In other words, his... His focus has to be so singular to make sure that none of those areas go without maintenance, without conscientious rule and devout faithfulness until the Lord appears. That's the vision Paul leaves Timothy. He doesn't give him a timetable. Doesn't, doesn't, no prophetic calendar here. Just in, until the Lord comes. This is, look forward to his coming as the idea. It's a, it's until the appearing and um, 
and, to, and, and do these things until the very end. So let's look, let's look uh, tonight. We looked last time about what he flees from, what he follows after. But the man of God also fights for the, for the faith. And he is faithful to the commandment, the summing up of all the duties pastorally and evangelistically that he's been given. This word, this word fight there, notice it in verse 12. Fight. It carries the idea of, of an ongoing, continual fight. Continually fight the good fight of faith. And faith has the definite article in front of it. In the original, it's the faith, the Christian faith. He told Timothy to follow after faithfulness. That's verse 11, remember? Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith. He's to pursue faith and faithfulness subjectively as he trusts God in an abiding way and continues to take him at his word. And then verse 12, he says, fight for the object of faith, the Christian doctrine, the gospel, and all that pertains to it. The whole New Testament revelation, he's to, he's to fight for that and he's to do it continually. And every word matters. Every component of it is important. And he's to fight on. And it, it, if you look at the, the language, it's, it's beautiful here. It's agonizomai agon, both the, the verb form and then the cognate noun form were there. So it could be translated, fight the fight, contend in the contest, struggle uh, amidst the, uh, the, the striving, you could say. Um, they're, they're cognate words and they have the idea of being uh, of, of being engaged in an event. And I think uh, as one writer was pointing that word uh, good, not only is, is internal goodness, but it has also the idea of uh, good as to form and technique. It, it is uh, beautiful in presentation. So it's as if Timothy is in this ring, he's contending for the truth, he's fighting against all opposition um, in, in a constant uh, battle, and as he wields the sword of the spirit, and as he battles in prayer, the whole event is is looked upon as though there are spectators in the stands watching this. And Timothy's entire life of fighting for that truth is looked at as as a as a good, beautiful uh, uh, contest, whereby he is standing f- for the right cause, for a, a good cause, and doing so with all his might. It is, it is a, a picture of a fighting in, in a contest that never ends and, and viewing that from the outside. The, the, Paul may have had the, the Olympic Games on his mind. He may have had a, a boxer or a wrestler in mind. There's someone involved. And he's competing and he's, he's, he's charging Timothy. Fight on, Timothy. Fight that good fight for the faith. Fight the good fight for the faith. The faith, as I've often heard it taught and read, that it it involves the doctrine. And yet, um, it's it's the doctrine, but the doctrine, as you see, whether it be Ephesians or Colossians or Romans, it tells us what's true from God. And then with the doctrine comes the duties, the Christian life. So Timothy has to... Fight for the true gospel by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is salvation. And also, he's to live in such a way that that Christian faith is seen visibly in his Christian life. That's very important. We set aside Christ as Lord in our hearts first, and then we give an answer, Peter said, for the, for the hope that is in us. He's to fight for the faith and he's to live and adorn the Christian faith, which means uh, fighting uh, with all, all gentleness and at times all boldness, um, with great zeal, Romans talks about, and, and w- in a way that is befitting that faith. He's to fight for the faith. And this is, again, a good, good cause, a good fight. But it's not an easy one. In fact, uh, Kenneth Wiest in, Wiest in his commentary, he's a great Greek scholar, he pointed out that in the first century, when a boxer would be in the ring fighting, the inside of his glove was, was nice and, and 
lined with fur, very comfortable, just like a pair of winter gloves. But on the outside, it was made of hardened ox hide and sewn into it was lead and iron. So to be hit with that would be to really suffer some, some, some damaging blows to the face. And so, in fact, in that culture, if you lost a, a, a boxing match, your eyes would be gouged out. It was a great humiliation. Um, Paul, as you know, when he, when he ran, he, he said he didn't want to win. He didn't even box as though beating the air. He wanted to win the prize. He didn't run without uh, uh, an eye for that prize. And he says in Corinthians 9, people do that for a, a wreath, or today would be a medal, that's going to pass away. That future generations won't even remember about. This cause, this fight, has eternal import and, and, and is packed with significance. It is the, the faith that, was deli- that, that Christ died for and rose again for. It's the faith that saves souls from an eternity in hell. It's the, it's the Christian faith. It's the only true religion in all the world. It is the greatest cause. And he has called Timothy to fight and, and keep on fighting for the faith. And it is what he's to do. He, he, he has read about, uh, wrote about, uh, differently in 2 Timothy 1. He talks about guarding by the Holy Spirit that treasure that's been entrusted to you. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.20, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and opposing and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. He just says, anything that comes against Christianity isn't even knowledge. It's knowledge falsely called. It's false knowledge. It is, it is, it is false. It is, it is a deception and it is to be refuted. And Timothy is to give himself to that fight. Same, isn't that a good fight? That's a good fight. I think of, of young people when they're in, when they're in school, they're being presented with, with um, aberrant views of, of how life began and how, how we got here. And, and a young person says, well, I, I don't believe that. I believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's fighting for the faith. And that is a fight. And and, and it's many things. And now it's, it's, it's almost every major... Um, I just think of the, the institutions God has ordained. He's ordained government. He's ordained marriage. He's ordained the church. All three are under constant attack. And so anytime you contend for uh, the, the, the divine right of government to rule over people, uh, you are contending for the faith. That's part of the Christian faith that's been taught. Anytime you contend for the gospel of grace, you are contending for the faith. And... Defining marriage as between one man and one woman for life. You are, spe- you are speaking about something that has its roots and, and origin in the Christian faith. And you are contending. Creation. We're going to have a, a March 15th. They're going to come here. We'll do a special creation uh, night. You don't want to miss that. You want to bring some friends to that. But why, why would we do that? Why would we bring a special speaker in here to, to tell us about creation? Because creation is part of the Bible. It's part of what we've been entrusted with. And we fight for what is right concerning the beginning. Well, how does Paul do this? this don't miss this. One of the reasons people are not contending for the faith is because they have a lack of vision. Notice what, the, what verse 12 says. Fight the good fight of faith. And I notice the next phrase. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Take hold. Or in other words, has the idea of possessing something and gripping something hard into your hand so that you have a firm hold of it. It's, 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 I just picture a, a batter coming up to the plate holding that bat and he's not holding it casually or with one hand. He's gripping it with all of his strength because he wants to hit the ball out of the park. It's a strong hold. It's in the aorist tense, which means um, it's, it's a, a once for all taking hold. And here 
uh, just the, the, the Greek grammatics have it that it's a, a culminative aorist. It's looking to the, the, the f- most far-reaching result of that taking hold of faith. And here it's, it, it's, he's talking about uh, eternal life to which you were called. You see, Timothy has already entered into the eternal life. He's had some possession of it as a saved person, but he has not taken hold of the, the end result of that eternal life, even the salvation of his soul, 1 Peter 1a. The, the end, the, 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 the passing from this life into glory, being in the presence of God. And so Timothy is telling him, you fight in the here and the now with a firm grip on what you are going to possess in the hereafter. When the life is over, You have your eye fixed on that, and so you continue to fight in the present. That's what Paul is instructing Timothy to do. In fact, that's exactly how Paul lived his life. He says in First Peter or Philippians three twelve, he says, "Not that I have already attained to this, or or have already become perfected, but I press on that I may take hold of that." uh, To to which I have been called, to, to which Christ has called me heavenward, but that for which. Christ has laid hold of me. And he was speaking there about uh, taking hold of glory, taking hold of Christ's likeness experientially in his own body. And that striving, that vision caused him to press on in his earthly journey, whether it be shipwreck, sleepless nights, persecution, false teachers, whatever he faced, He had a singular goal, to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of him. Do you know what Christ laid hold of Timothy and Paul for? He's the God of all grace who called them to his eternal glory. 1 Peter 5.10 You've been called to his eternal glory, saints. That's why God saved you. He saved you so that you can share in his own glory. That someday you may uh, share in his, uh, 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 be partake, or you're already a partaker of a divine nature. But Timothy says you'll have a body like unto his own glorious body. He wants you to share in what he has as uh, a joint heir with Christ. He's saying, lay Take hold of eternal life. See what you've been called to. And don't let go of that. Take hold of it once for all. And, and that is the vision, the, the, the taking hold of, that makes the fighting sustainable. The moment you lose the vision, that's when you lose the fight. Okay? I even, I even see that now. The more I could taste of heaven, the more I could taste of what's to come, the more emboldened I am now to tell people about Christ and the wrath to come and the need to escape judgment through Christ, the Savior, the Lord. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Saint, are you, are you laying hold of it? Is it what you're looking forward to? Do you see it? Can, can you just say, it could be any moment. It could be any time. It could be, it could be tonight. It's a mystery that's been revealed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And the perishable will put on the imperishable. The mortal, mortal will put on immortality. When Christ comes, there's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a rapture. The dead and saints in Christ are going to rise. Uh, Those who are alive will be caught up with him. That is what we're to look forward to. He says that that's the first component of the vision. But he's also to have not just frontward vision of what's to come. He's to have a backward memory of what's past. Notice 12C. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. How's how's Paul, how's Timothy to fight this fight? First, by looking to what he's been called to, by laying hold of that eternal life, the the cumulative, the, the, the culminative end of that. And he is to remember the good confession. What's that? What's this good confession in the presence of many witnesses? Oh, is this his ordination? Is this uh, his conversion? Is this his baptism? What is, what is he referring to? Well, it's, it, it's, um, it's his baptism. It's his baptism. The good 
confession. Notice Paul uses the word good a lot. It's a good faith. It's a good uh, confession. Uh, Jesus made a good confession. It's there a lot. The, the confession, amulageo, means to say the same thing as, to agree. And here, it's speaking about speaking the same thing in the presence of many witnesses. He's calling Timothy back to the time when he made public his faith and identity in Christ Jesus as his Lord. And he did that not privately, publicly, in front of many witnesses. Those would be other believers. This is the confession of faith that we're to hold fast to without wavering. So there's a future hope, but there's also a present accountability. The Christian faith is public. And he's calling Timothy to remember, you made a profession of faith in front of these witnesses. You want to make good on that profession. You want to stand as a faithful representative of the one whom you claim is your Lord and your Savior. That confession, you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's why baptism is so important. Because it's the public confession before many witnesses. That one has indeed been joined to the body of Christ. By one spirit, we have all been baptized into one body. The dry baptism, the spirit baptism happens at conversion. The water baptism, the wet baptism happens in front of many witnesses. And the water confirms the dry baptism of the spirit. If you refuse to be water baptized, you should really ask yourself if you've been spirit baptized. Because the spirit in you is grieved unless you go public with what the spirit of God has done to make you a new creation. It is a public affair. Christianity, a public faith. Jesus says, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father who is in heaven. So Timothy didn't. He had his good confession. And you, if you're faithful to the Lord Jesus and have been truly converted, you too have had a public confession of faith. And he draws that to Timothy's mind. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and you made in the past the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, in the present time, I charge you, strong word, uh, a, a curtness to it, a, 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 an urgency, kind of a, 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 the snap of a, of a commanding officer in the military you, is how that word was used in the first century. He's saying, I charge you as an enlisted man. I charge you, watch this, in the presence of God, witness number one, the God who gives and preserves life to everything in creation, and of Christ Jesus, witness number two, who before Pilate testified the good confession. Before these two witnesses, the Father who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus, who witnessed a good who, uh, confession, who testified a good confession. Timothy, keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, you talk about adding weight and gravity and solemnity to what Timothy is hearing. Timothy has been called by this God. Timothy's life is being sustained by God, the father, the sustainer, the, the, the generator of life, the preserver of life. And Timothy is preaching and, and, and to uphold Christ Jesus as head of the church. And so now he calls God, the father, and he calls God, the son as witness to this charge that Timothy's received to keep the commandment without stain. Wow. What a charge. It's an authoritative message from the apostle to the, the young pastor calling two members of the Trinity as witnesses to that charge. Could you imagine the weight of this? Well, let's, let's look at, at just who this, these witnesses are and we'll feel the weight of it ourselves. God himself, the fountain of life, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereign and majestic ruler over all people. He's, when he says, um, number one, the, the, the first witness, the God who gives life to all things, this is, is speaking about the fact that, that, that God the Father is 
um, the preserver of life. Acts 17, 25 says he gives to all people life, breath, and all things. So if Timothy draws another breath, it's because the father preserves him. If, if Timothy's heart beats another round of, of beats, it's because the father let it be. Job 12, 10 tells us this in speaking of God, the father in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. This is why we don't boast about tomorrow. James 4, 13 through 17. We say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. Why? Because our very life is, 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 he is our life support. We are borrowing life continually from him. He is the author of life and the preserver of it. And we ought never to forget. And here he calls to mind that God, that, he, that, that he's charging Timothy in the presence of the one who has given Timothy life and is sustaining his life at this very moment. Awesome, awesome reality. Second witness is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus the, he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord speaks of, of his sovereign rule. Jesus, he's a savior. Christ, he's the anointed Messiah. This is full majesty, full sovereignty to the Lord Jesus Christ. And drawing attention specifically to his faithful confession before an authority that had the power to take his physical life. He's talking about John 19, Matthew 26, Jesus standing before Pilate. Remember why he went to Pilate? Because the Jews couldn't condemn him. They didn't have the power of the sword. Rome had that power, so they had to deliver him to Pilate. So he stands before Pilate, and Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Matthew 27, 11. He says, it is as you say. I'm not going to back down from the position that I have over my covenant people. It is as you say. Notice, full boldness and authority. He then, he then uh, clarifies a little bit further in John 18, 36. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my subjects would fight. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate responds, so... Are you a king? He says, you said it. That I, you say correctly that I am a king. And it's true that for this I was born. And for this I came into the world. To testify to the truth. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God. It was his kingdom. And he testified to the truth of who he is and what he, his father sent him to do. And he is bold in the face of death in testifying to that good confession. He testified. Martyreo is the word. It means to witness. And Pilate even, even said, don't you realize I have the power to release you? And I have the power to take your life. And Jesus says, you'd have no power over me. I mean, it's like, that's like the apostles who followed in Jesus way. And the, the, the Jewish council said, you, we told you, we commanded you never again to speak in this name. And they said, well, whether it is right or not to speak in this name, we'll let you decide, but we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Where did that boldness and fearless confession come from? It came from the Lord Christ himself, who when he was in that place, standing in the face of death, did not back down, but said he was the king, and he knew that in saying that, he would be given over to the people and then to the cross. Jesus laid down his life for the cause and message that he was entrusted with. And his followers do 
the same. Just read church history. Just read the book of Acts. Just read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Just, just see what is there. In fact, uh, John Bunyan in the classic Pilgrim's Progress picked this up when, when Christian and Faithful at the end after they go to the Vanity Fair. Uh, Faithful is, it speaks of this genuine joy, this lasting peace, this unfailing love, this true contentment that comes through Jesus Christ and the people would have none of it so they killed him. And he says, what I've professed with my mouth, I now seal with my blood. Jesus laid down his life. He says, the world hated me without a cause. John 15. If they hated me, they'll hate you also. Notice, he's bringing attention to the witness, the second witness, Christ, who stood in that place facing death and delivered and testified the good confession. It is as you say, I am a king. Wow. Does that embolden you, Saint? That's how your Lord stood. Does Acts 4 embolden you? The apostles, they didn't, they didn't regard their life. It wasn't dear to them. They laid hold on that which is truly life. They, as 12 says, took hold of eternal life. They had a view to the end. And we're able to fight the good fight for the faith. So Paul reminds Timothy of the one who has given him and has sustained his life all the way through. And the one whose, whose message he bears. The one who stood before Pontius Pilate and testified the good confession with unflinching boldness. And so, calling these witnesses to mind, he says, Timothy... I'm charging you now, son. I'm charging you. Preserve, keep, obey, guard. All those ideas are there in the word keep. That commandment. And do so in a way that is blameless and irreproachable. How do you recognize a man of God? You recognize him by what he fights for. He fights for the faith and does so knowing the witnesses, God, the father, God, the son. Remember he said, I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. That's how Paul ends second Timothy. Reminding of the Father, Christ and his kingdom and the judgment to come. Wow, that's compelling, guys. That's compelling. You think about that. Timothy, some say he was timid. He had a spirit of fear. He was to be an example, though he was young. He had to be an example of, of, of purity and, and knowledge and faith and speech. And an example to all. He was to give attention to reading to exhortation, to teaching. He used to do a lot of stuff. Timothy had a big job at Ephesus. And he's emboldened here to keep that commandment, to keep on keeping it, to continually keep it, and to do so in a way that was blameless. Just as James says that believers are to be unspotted by the world. In other words, we're to be so separate from it that we're, we're, we're distinct from its... its uh, Obvious corruption. P Peter wrote in 3.14 that the believers who are looking for Christ's coming are to be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. It means they're living righteously, waiting for his return so that they're not ashamed at his coming. Timothy is to avoid disqualification. He's to avoid anything that would soil his righteousness, taint his holiness, impinge on his purity, anything that would cause a dereliction of duty. He was to faithfully carry out his calling and he was not to fall from the ministry. This is right here in verse 14. Keep the commandment without stain or reproach. 
First Timothy 3 gives a list of all the things he's supposed to have in his character, being respectable, prudent, temperate, a one-woman man, able to teach, not, a, uh, not given to any extremes, wine or, or anything else, gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, managing his house well, not a new convert, not puffed up. Keep the commandment. Keep the commandment. You know, he's got to know what to flee from again. The youthful lust, uh, love of money, desire for earthly accumulation of goods. He's, uh, he's to follow after by faithfulness, love. Oh, and it's love how God defines love. Remember? Subjectivity, relativity, individuality. Our culture, and even back then, doesn't want love as God defines it. We want love our way so that we get what we want. And love is completely selfless in scripture. You know you're loving when self is out of it. And it is the welfare and well-being of the one loved that has consumed your heart. Pursue love. I mean, look, read, read, read Paul's love for the Thessalonian church. How I longed for you. You're my joy, my crown. What is my hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus? He said, when I, I couldn't endure it any longer, not hearing about your faith. So I sent Timothy over there to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. I couldn't bear it for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and that my labor would be in vain. What is Paul consumed with? He's consumed with the saints. He's consumed with their sanctification. He's consumed with their strength and their faith and, and, and them not being, being, um, uh, seduced by Satan and being tempted to, to, to uh, be unfaithful. He was consumed with that. He had true love. He tells Timothy, pursue that. A quality of love for God's people that cares about their soul, cares about their, their righteousness, their purity, their knowledge, their, their, their obedience, all of those things. Hold, keep the commandment without stain. Follow after righteousness and love and faith and fight for the Christian faith, the beliefs as well as the behaviors, the doctrine as well as the duties. Christianity and the Christian life, the whole kit and caboodle. Hold fast to it, all of it. Defend it. Everything that is necessary for the maintenance and the continuance of of gospel ministry and the proper governance of Christ's church, you need to keep. Wow. Notice, how, did he, how was he to do this? Fight the good fight? With a vision, taking hold of the eternal life to which you are called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Forward look, backward look. Now he goes in verse 14 back to the forward look. Notice it. Keep it without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He sets it in Timothy's mind again. Christ is coming back, Timothy. And the word here, appearing, is only used for Christ's advent into the world. It was used once in, in 2 Timothy 1.9 about when he appeared to abolish death and bring life and immortality to life. That's when he came uh, as the virgin's uh, son and, and came to destroy what Adam uh, wrought in this world. His first coming was an appearing. But his second coming is, 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 is the, where the word's used most often. I think seven out of the eight times it's used is used for the second appearing. This speaks about when the, 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 the skies will be brightened, not by the sun, but by the divine sun, the Lord Jesus. It talks about the brightness of his appear in second Thessalonians two, eight, when he appears and slays the antichrist with the breath of his mouth and brings him to an end. By the appearing, the shining forth of his coming. This is what Timothy is to look for. Uh, Revelation describes it further. It says that the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed signs uh, in his presence. 
by which he deceived those who have received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Jesus is going to come in the brightness of his, uh, of, of his appearing. He's going to come with power and great glory. He's going to come with a host of angels in the Father's glory. And he's going to smote the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Just a word will, sl- will fall him into the lake of fire. Could you imagine the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ? Saints, Track that word appearing. It's where we get the word epiphany from. It is um, a beautiful word. It's epiphania in the Greek. Look it, look it up. Look up the verses of where you see it. And, and it's just glorious. Remember the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. It's Titus 2.13. He mentions it again in Timothy. It's coming. Yes, there's an apocalypse, the unveiling of Christ. There's the parousia, the, his coming. This speaks of his, of his coming with brightness and glory. And he wants Timothy to keep fighting, to keep following, to keep uh, forsaking and fleeing the lusts, and to keep um, following after righteousness until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul can't speak of the appearing of Christ without speaking about the, the, the sovereign timing of it. No one knows. Christ doesn't know. The angels don't know, according to Matthew 26 or 24, 36, and Acts 1 7. But it's coming. It's coming in his own time. And notice when Paul thinks of this, he breaks out into a doxology of praise saying if you think about the coming of christ and you start singing okay you are tracking with paul you have the same heart in fact if you're not singing about the christian faith something's not right something's amiss confess that say lord whatever keeps my heart from being a singing heart show me what it is why because as you look at the new testament the praise is is, is on the lips of believers it's there paul says we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs twice in this letter paul breaks out in doxology first when he remembers his own salvation which was a result of christ's first coming he says he had perfect patience towards me um as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Then net verse 17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What is Paul doing? He's giving a doxology, glorifying Christ who saved him from eternal hell. Then in chapter six, he, when he speaks about this Christ coming again in his brightness and his glory, he says that the father will bring it out at his own time. And then he just glorifies the Father, he was the blessed, the only sovereign, King of kings, Lord of lords. Real quick, blessed means eternally contented and happy in himself, self-satisfied. The one who gives life to everything, who borrows life from no one, who existed before creation, fully satisfied, fully content, and will be happy and content forever, even after he destroys this earth and renews it. He is the blessed. He's also the sovereign. That means the only one. He is the sovereign, the only sovereign. Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. He has a dynasty. He rules over all. He rules more specifically over the kings of the earth and the lords. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's God of gods, Psalm 136. He's lord of lords. He even rules the kings of the earth, Revelation 1, 5. Then he says he's Uh, He alone possesses immortality. That means he has this life that he borrowed from no one. He's had it for eternity in the past. And he'll continue to have it. And no one in the universe can rob him of it. He's deathless. He is unable to die. And guess what? We who are in Christ have been given immortality through Christ. So that the mortal will put on immortality. And the perishable will put on the imperishable. And it is awesome. And then it says that he He dwells in unapproachable light. He's so glorious, so unlike his creation, that even the light that covers him is unapproachable. 
Just like you can't even get near the rays of the sun, much less its core. We can't get near the atmosphere that covers our God, much less his essence. He is unapproachable. He's a consuming fire. He's a sun. He's all light. He's unapproachable. And because of this, Hebrew says, let us show gratitude and offer him an acceptable service with reverence and awe. No man has seen him in the full effulgence of his light or can without being consumed to him be honor. That means value and price belongs to him and eternal dominion. His rule will have no end. His kingdom is forever. If that is not enough to embolden Timothy to fight that good fight, to follow after what is right, to flee all that is wrong, and to keep that commandment, be faithful to it. Indeed, it is. So we all say, verse 16, the last word, amen. Father, thank you for these words. Embolden the church, embolden the elders, embolden me. May we see the Lord Jesus and his soon appearing. May we remember our baptism and our public confession of faith. May we live the confession that Jesus is Lord. And may we defend your word at every opportunity with all patience, with all prayer, with all diligence, holding up the shield of faith, pairing with the sword of the spirit and wearing the helmet of salvation. May we stand in the evil day. In Christ's name we pray, amen.